Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. So yesterday, at around the time of the announcement, you, Brad, were driving with your family into the hellscape known as Toronto. Yes. Evan, you were just about to hit the road to drive out of town. Oh, I was in the front yard uh, doing some lawn stuff. And that's when the news dropped. After seven years of being coach of the Detroit Red Wings, Jeff Blashill uh, was effectively relieved of his duties as it was announced that he was not going to be extended as head coach in Hockey Town. You called me at 2.05 p.m. Yeah. Because that's what people do at 2.05 p.m. They fire their head coach on a Saturday. Well... Was it his birthday? <laughs> <laughs> we'll get into we'll get into the timing, and I, I think we shouldn't have been surprised. No, but I really thought I thought it was going to happen, but I thought it was going to happen after the World Championships. But I was stupid for thinking that. But we'll get into it. But after seven years, this is the first time that we are talking about a non. Jeff Blashill, Detroit Red Wings. We're not oh. having the theoretical conversation of what's this year of Jeff Blashill going to be. All of my prepared, all of our prepared content into like what is Eisman going to decide about Blashill that we're planning on rolling out over the next couple of weeks immediately into the recycle bin. This we, is now a team with a head coaching vacancy. Uh, I wish we had a, um, like a highlight snippet of all the things we said when Blashill got hired. Oh, yeah. No, I know. We were so excited and full of optimism. So here we are. I don't even know how to start this podcast. Are you guys th – th there's no structure to this. And the same thing for the interview coming later. There's no structure. I think this is just a, a topic that just dominates the entire podcast. Are you guys ready? Yes, I'll let you do the intro first. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Uh, for the first time in a long time, talking about a head coaching vacancy. Uh, here to talk all things about the Detroit Red Wings and the world of hockey. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, believe it or not, we're going to be talking about Jeff Blashill. <laughs> and uh, that has kind of, spo not spoiled, but has changed what our plans were for immediate after uh like post red wing season conclusion content and we'll get into that later um but it's going to be jeff blashill the decision what comes next there is an interview with our good friends max boltman uh, and prashanth Iyer as well where we talk more about the the decision to not renew blashill as well as some potential future coaching options and we'll, we'll we will also be talking about um the stanley cup playoffs we'll be doing some predictions we'll be reading out our stupid absolutely wrong brackets and uh, we'll uh, we'll give you a chance to join in on all, join in on all of that, as well as uh, some other small pieces of news, depending on what we're able to cover. The SHL transfer agreement, the U18 tournament concluding today, and uh, we'll get some betting odds as well. So the uh, the first thing I want to talk about here, actually, before we get into it, is the Wings Money on the Board campaign has. Not completely concluded. I think some of your season-long pledges have to do with uh, who wins the Calder Trophy. So I think we're going to get some bonus donations when that comes out. But for all intents and purposes, we're wrapping it up for the season. Our goal was $20,000 raised over the 2021-2022 NHL season. Heading into the final evening, we were at $16,000, just about. We have well exceeded $25,000 raised this season for the Jamie Daniels Foundation through Wings Money on the Board. So uh, from us, from Prashant Iyer, who who created and is running the program with us, from the, the Jamie Daniels Foundation, from Ken, thank you all so, so, so very much. Blown away. Just absolutely blown away. And this was our first time running this, so I mean, we're just doing our best, and we have so many ideas to make this thing even bigger and better than uh, next time. So, or better next time. So, we can't wait for that. But what a phenomenal show! Thank you all so very much. Um, the impact that you've made, and and the difference that you've made in the way this community has come together, there really aren't words to articulate that. So, you knocked it out of the park, and, and we're just blown away. All right. The Detroit Red Wings. First of all, I, I actually want to call it one thing. 
how funny is it that it actually turned out that the team announced this? Not a single reporter, not a single person outside actually had the leak. It was the team who made the actual announcement. Like, Wait, you're I, surprised by that? Well, no, not surprised, but it's like, I think this is one of the only situations across all of major professional sports in North America where you can be confident that that would be the case, right? I think it was one of those things like, you know, like um, for the nuclear missile codes where they put the keys in yeah. and then they're like three, two, one, they both turn it at the same time. Yeah. I think that was what it was. It has to be it. And like it came out at exactly 2 p.m. So this was obviously a scheduled thing. And it came from the Detroit Red Wings. Did you call me or Brad first? Um, I actually don't know. I think I... It must have been me because it was... If you called me at 2.05. You couldn't have talked to Brad for only five minutes. No, I called Brad first. I was on the highway. I think we talked for 30 seconds. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I called Brad just before you. Okay. Oh, because you were already texting me back. That's what it was. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. Well, yeah. now, okay. I'm not upset. So at 2 p.m., the, the Red Wings tweeted out or announced, uh, Executive Vice President and General Manager Steve Eisman announced today that the team will not renew the contracts of head coach Jeff Blashill, assistant coach Doug Huda, and goaltending coach Jeff Saleko. So that is a non-renewal of contracts. So it was correct that it wasn't a two-year deal after all. It was either just a one-year deal or a one-year plus team option. So if that option existed, it wasn't picked up. For all intents and purposes, we'll say he was fired, but the contract just expired. Initial reactions. Sadness and relief is probably the best way I can put it. Because, you know, for as critical as uh, we and, and myself especially were of most of Blashill's tenure with the Wings, the hope the entire time was for it to turn around and for Blashill to make it work. But it was becoming obvious as time went on that wasn't going to happen. And then the way they started so promising this year and then just cratered in the second, we'll call it half, even though it's probably more than half of the season, it really drove home, drove home the point that this isn't going to get better for him or with him. Um, but obviously from all reports, Jeff was a good dude. People enjoyed working with him. His players liked him. He was very well liked and respected around the organization. But it just wasn't working, and it was clear that it wasn't going to work. So a new direction was needed. So, you know, you, you feel for Blash. It sucks. Like I said, the whole time we were hard on him because we wanted him to do better, and then hopefully he could have stuck. Didn't happen. Wasn't happening. So this was, as I've made clear over the last few months, the obvious right call. Um, but it doesn't, it's not something to be happy about. You understand that it's, it's good for the benefit of the organization going forward, but some shitty things have to happen for that to occur. It's a particularly particularly difficult situation because I really do believe, and this is just conjecture, this is based on my interpretation of the situation, I don't think Steve Eisman planned to come into this offseason to, to change the coach. I think, I mean, stating the obvious here, it would have been his preference if he didn't have to. Not because he, he necessarily thought Jeff Blasio was going to be the coach of the future, but this is still a precarious part of the rebuild where if you're bringing in a new voice – they're going to need a lot to build a foundation beneath them. And it is hard to be to build that foundation under a team that is still, by and large, a losing team. A lot's going to have to change on this Red Wings roster next year for this, for this next head coach to have a winning team. But I agree. I, I think this was the right call. I think the way this year really unfolded, the first half, I thought, wow. Or let's say the first third. Let's not exaggerate here. Pre-December. Pre yeah. I thought, wow, a lot of things are going right. I'm seeing a lot of different things from Jeff Blaschel that I haven't seen before, especially in terms of like the distribution of ice time. You know, Moritz Sider and Lucas Raymond don't have the seasons that they have if he wasn't letting them, right? His deployment is is half the battle with them. Um, and even in December when things started to go south, a lot of that was, you know, he had terrible goalies. Ned and Grice were playing god awful hockey. COVID hit, everything got, you know, guys were in and out of the lineup again. 
I was willing to to kind of see past that and think I've seen enough from Jeff Blashill to be comfortable with him steering the ship moving forward, especially through this next little mini phase of the rebuild. But once those terrible, like headline drawing losses started, eight, nine, 10, 11 goals consistently, that's something else. And you just look at the look at the way the guys approach the game later in the year. I understand that was a beleaguered team. I understand that team was beat up, you know, depleted. They had mid-level AHLers in the lineup, and that was their best option. That's not a team that where you can necessarily blame any one person, player, or coach and say, oh, it's your fault that this is happening. But, yeah, I think it was just time for a new voice. I think it's time for something that can re-energize this team and get them to buy in and get them to believe because – I think keeping Blasha would have run the risk of getting into the dark years that we just saw the Red Wings pull themselves out of. I don't think we can bear to see another absolutely depressed Dylan Larkin again. And I think we came dangerously close in the last half of this year. And whether or not that's Jeff Blasha's fault is, is up for debate, and we'll do that today. But there's no debating the fact that changing the coach can reinvigorate a team and, and help give them that kickstart. Just look at Vancouver. Mm-hmm. Absolute tailspin at the start of the year. They bring in Boost Boudreaux, who just says hello, and people laugh. And they're like, I like this guy a lot. It totally changed their season around. I'm not saying the Red Wings should have done it sooner, but you're right. A new voice is something that this team desperately needs because we saw a team that was checked out for the last, I don't know, 15 games, let's say. And when you're a professional athlete, that's still inexcusable, even if you're the last place team in the league. So if a coach can't get the players up to play a game and they've been getting blown out the way they were, I think the decision was made a long time ago. I think they were just trying to attempt to find the the optimal timing for this, which was 2 p.m. on Saturday. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Once high noon was done, high noon tea was done. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So I said to I, – I think I said this in the Discord. I expected – I expected that it would happen as much as you can ever expect anything yeah. from Steve Eisman. Yeah. I, like, I had no leak. I had no credible source. I, we just, like, from us talking and, and analyzing the season, I thought the change was going to happen in the offseason. But I stupidly thought it would happen post-World Championship because uh, Jeff Blaschel is going to coach at the World Championships. And the reason that was dumb is Steve Eisman is a good guy and Jeff Blaschel is a great guy. And we know both those things to be verifiably true. Steve Weisman wasn't going to leave Jeff Blaschel in the lurch if he's going to have to search for another job opportunity. Same goes for Huda and Seleko. You need to let the, especially actually for the assistant coach and the goalie coach, it's not as easy for them to find work. And you need to give them every every opportunity they can to to find their next landing spot because once those go, they start to go fast. And you don't want to wait and you want to leave them out in the lurch and... I don't know. It's not going to be an easy conversation. If you're going to let them go. You do it sooner rather than later as a, a courteous thing to them. Yeah. And and that's what happened. The one piece of information that I did get was that I, I think there was some expectation from the coaching staff that this was coming. I don't think it came as a complete shock to them, but that's not world breaking news, right? Like if you're out coaching a team and you get tuned up nine, two or whatever it was by Arizona, and that's not the, the only one only game in conversation for your worst game of the season. Your job's on the line, especially with an expiring contract. I mean, it was in the Red Wings' favor to do it quickly, too, because for all the same reasons, the Red Wings want to get a head start on their coaching search. Exactly. They want to have every candidate available to them before other teams that might need coaches or start scooping coaches up, because there's a lot of interim coaches around the NHL right now. Um, and, you know, it's it's just – and if you do hire the new coach, you want to give that new coach as long as possible to build a plan, to build build a strategy for next season right and this is a fairly common practice in other sports like i mean black monday is a thing in the nfl like the monday after the final day of the regular season everybody knows if you're getting canned it's that day yeah um so yeah the fact that it happened 16 hours after the red wings final game ended it shouldn't be a surprise if it was going to happen that's exactly when it should have happened there's going to be a lot of uh, – there are a lot of joking comments like, oh, what's the celebration? You know, how are you choosing to celebrate this? And I don't want to get all high and mighty. Like I think the very obvious point – and you mentioned this, Brad. This is like a human being. This is a, like these are really good people who lost their jobs. So 
if you're going to be celebrating at this this at all, like it has to be from a sporting aspect. But I also don't want to be like high and mighty and say like this is all a bad thing. I agree. I, th- I think this is right for the Red Wings' future. Um, but just to get to Jeff Blaschel as a person, one of the most highly respected and well liked people in in hockey circles in Michigan and across the NHL. Um, he'll get another sniff for sure. He'll get it if he wants it. I've heard oh, yeah. I've heard suggestions of you know, he'd be a great assistant coach somewhere else in the NHL and then probably get another head coaching gig. Um, if he wants it, he might be a really good fit to, for an NCAA program, you know, especially considering what's, what might be available in Michigan, like that would be a fantastic fit. So there's going to be a lot there for him. And and personally, you know, best of luck to him. You're right, Brad. I, I'm sorry that it didn't work out here. And that's where the, the the kind of melancholy part of it comes in, where you're like, you don't you don't want to be happy that this happened because you wish it could have worked out this way. But it might it, be the best thing for Jeff Blaschel, to be honest. It, <sighs> Gets out of a, a tricky situation where things just kind of haven't. He was dealt the worst possible hand from the absolute start, and maybe this is something when he looks back on it will be a blessing in disguise. So let's, let's, I think, talk about, and with the very obvious qualifier here that we're not trying to like kick someone who's down, but let's talk about what you would want to see changed from what we saw from Jeff Blashill to the next coaching staff, the next head coach and whoever he brings in. And Alex Tangay will be part of that coaching staff because he was not let go. Um, <laughs> let's start with get blown out less. <laughs> Win more games. Hot Are, take. There you go. If the Red Wings finished where they are this year, but they only got blown out like three times the whole year, are we really that upset with this season? No, no. And that's the crux of it, right? So the biggest thing for the Red Wings right now, and and we talk about this a little more with Max and Prashanth, is they needed a coach who needs to be able to keep this on the rails. It's a young, bad team. The hardest thing to do with this team right now is to keep them from the problems from compounding when it starts to get bad. You know, the, like you said, the Red Wings were doing well for the first six weeks of the season, and then the goalies went in the tank, and then the defense went in the tank, and then the special teams went in the tank, and then everything went in the tank. And then they were all in the tank, and they somehow fell at the bottom of the tank. Um, so to be able to prevent situations like that, keep the team mentally strong and motivated, which was very obviously an issue, because this isn't the only season where the Red Wings have had issues getting absolutely caved on a regular basis. So we can't act like that was an ex- exclusively a 2022 problem. It wasn't. It just got worse. Yeah. And the Red Wings are likely only getting younger as we're going forward. So it's going to be super, super important to get that right. Because I've talked about this before and we talk about it with Max and Prashanth. I'm usually a big fan of hiring the coach that fits your roster. We don't know what the Red Wings are going to look like yet. What the Red Wings are going to look like this upcoming season is going to be vastly different from what they're going to look like when they're building a contender. So I I don't even think you need to factor that in, whether you want a possession coach, a hard-nosed coach, or, or whatever. You pick the coach that can handle the room the best right now and and go from there and you know you can obviously you obviously have to factor in strategy and philosophy and yada 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 because you're not going to bring in a you know mike keenan and and think it's going to work out well just because he can command a room with his crazy bullshit but (laughs) um yeah i i think that's first and foremost and i i think if you solve that problem a lot of the other problems get solved naturally or at least improve this team's defense is still going to be atrocious next year. Nedeljkovic is hopefully going to be more consistent, but he's still a youngish goalie going into his second full NHL season. There's going to be a lot of bad nights. Um, you know, the special teams, maybe they have a little more confidence. Maybe they're playing in a bit more of a structure, or maybe they're playing in less of a structure, whatever the philosophy might be. That should hopefully improve. But yeah, so the the, the short answer is, I want a coach who can keep the problems from compounding. And the long answer is, well, everything else needs to get better because it was all bad. So (laughs) start with the most important problem and then work your way down from there. I think the name of the game here is this coach is going to have to adapt to whatever Eisman decides to do with this team. There, 
there's, I think, a little bit of a fork in the road here, depending on whether you want to apply that. I'm, I'm sure Eisenhower will throw that away and take the middle path that, that's not apparent to people. But there's a perceived fork in the road here where you either have to commit to next year you're going to get better so you don't live in purgatory again, or you lean into a possible franchise-changing draft next season and just, you know, to well oversimplify it, suck for a little bit longer. And that's going to dictate how the coach is going to be able to run this team. Because if you have better tools, those things that you suggested, Brad, they don't become easier, but they become more possible. But if you have a Red Wings team that is as bad or even worse than this one, especially if you consider the, the assets that they had on defense, then, you know, that's a that's a big battle to stop those issues from compounding. It's a big battle to stop your defense from falling apart when the personnel just isn't good enough to do it. It's a big battle to stop your goalies from collapsing and keeping their confidence up when they're playing behind a brutal, brutal defense. And that's, this is why I keep, I, I'm thinking they're going to do the old recycling of a former NHL coach. Whether so, people like that or not, I think that's what they would probably do. So that's funny that you say that because who has Steve Eisman hired? Guy Boucher and John Cooper. Who've had no experience. Who have, who both came into their roles with, Guy Boucher had one year in the AHL and John Cooper had three years in the AHL, both of them having worked in lower leagues before. Um, no NHL experience, either of them. So, I mean, that stands to indicate that he's not afraid to bring in someone who who hasn't done it in the NHL before. Vinny LeCavalier. <laughs> hey, Martin St. Louis is having a lot of success right now, right? Sergei Fedorov. A lot of people wouldn't hate that. Although I'm sure I'm sure that one's polarizing. I not in Detroit. Personally, I don't know what Steve Eiserman's relationship is with Sergey Fedorov. I assume it's quite good, and I don't know if I really want. <laughs> Would you want to hire your best friend for that job, or not a best friend, but like a very someone you've gone to battle with, and like you're very close with? I see yes, absolutely. The NHL is the most like has more nepotism than any other <laughs> professional sport. I see what you're saying. What if he sucks? Because that's not the same as Lidstrom, right? And that's not the same as Draper. The no, head the, coach is on the chopping block from day one. Pretty much diffuses every lit as soon as that guy steps in the building. Yeah, or yeah. As soon as the ink dries, and he there's already content, a contentious relationship between the team and Fedorov, right? So, what better way to mend fences? Yeah. So one name that I did hear, and I don't want to say this as like this is the favorite candidate. To give you an idea of how many candidates there are and how many you should be considering for a future coaching option, go read Max's article about the uh, head coaches that could replace Jeff Blashill. Max will be the first one to tell you that it, that's not a an exhaustive, holistic list, but it is quite a few names as is. So when I say I heard a name, it's not the only name. But one where there is reportedly interest from the Red Wings is Benoit Gru. Uh, head coach of the Syracuse Crunch, who are notably the AHL affiliate for the Tampa Bay Lightning. You can connect the dots there. C. Wiseman knows him from his time in Tampa Bay. Um, from Max's piece, he calls out that Julian Breezeblah, who took over for Wiseman as GM in Tampa, has called uh, Benoit a hockey genius. So, oh, so we should hire him then. <laughs> we should hire you. You're a hockey yeah. genius. Yeah. So they hearing that the interest is there from the Red Wings, and then adding up, you know, those connections and seeing what. Uh, what Julian Breezeblas said, that's one as well. Fits the bill. Or he said that because he's not and wants to, f wants to get galaxy him. brain yeah. a team to take him. <laughs> so, you know, Benoit Gru, he, he fits that bill, right? He's he's familiar. Eisenman knows who he is. He's worked with him directly before. He's running a pretty successful program over in Syracuse. And again, someone with no NHL experience. So if, if Steve Eisenman's preference is to bring in someone who hasn't been through the ringer, and hasn't done this before, and he can maybe mold a little bit as a coach, or you know, there's a little bit more time or patience for. I understand what you're saying, Evan, that you think it'll be someone who's been through the cycle before, but I, I think it's 50-50, yes or no on that. Good answer. 50-50, eh? Either happens or it doesn't. I just don't think I don't think it's necessarily likely that's yeah, gonna be a I'm, former head coach. That's just like my perspective on it. I my my fear would be they bring in a guy with no experience and they don't have answers at the NHL level because uh, Jeff Blashill was touted as having won at every single level and 
blah, 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 blah. And it just never really worked out. And it looked like he never had answers when the wheels fell off. So that's why I kind of feel like it might be better to bring in a, a veteran co coach for now. And it, they may not be the answer long term, but maybe it can instill some good habits and good culture. You're not to say that there's not, but I mean, when someone says they're, they hate playing hockey or it's, they're sad. <laughs> The Something's emo. going wrong. Yeah. yeah, there's something wrong internally. You're big on Paul Maurice, eh? say. <laughs> How did you know? Yeah. <laughs> What's your take? I'm a Ken Hitchcock guy, actually. Oh, hell yeah. Just go full bore. Have you seen a picture of Benoit Grew? Yeah. Wish.com Bruce Boudreaux. <laughs> Stop with your Wish.com jokes. <laughs> you know what someone said to me? Like, what's with all these bald coaches? Listen, male pattern baldness is a thing. And just because I'm flanked by two genetic freaks whose hairlines only get thicker... We're all doing our best out here, all right? Yeah. Are we? I'm not even trying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do deserve that for all the short jokes. <laughs> I'll concede. <laughs> but no, um, if you are going to bring in a coach with no NHL experience, it is probably advantageous that you bring in a coach who has a long track record in junior hockey and a good AHL program to then come up and take over a very young team. So it's not going to feel all that dissimilar to what he's been doing for the last 15 to 20 years. He, his, every head coaching stop he has had so far has had a heavy emphasis on development because that's what the juniors and the AHL is for. So if he can win at those levels, and if you look at his track record with Gatineau and Syracuse, yeah, his teams win a hell of a lot more than they lose. And if he can handle that while also managing development, and I think nobody would argue that over the last however many years, Tampa's been the best developmental program in the NHL. There's a lot to like in the, we'll call it the theory behind hiring him. Um, who is he as a coach in terms of philosophy, tactics? Now, I have no damn idea. I think he coached the Canadian World Juniors for a year, and that's about as much as I paid attention to him before this. Um, so obviously going to have to do a lot of deep dives into a lot of coaches. Um, but yeah, the, the theory behind why Gru would be a good coach is sound. And I could definitely get on board with that. I think there are a lot of other really good names called out as well from every rank. People who have experience in the NHL, people who have experience in the AHL. I think there's some, uh, interesting names from college or junior hockey and, you know, very transparently, and this speaks to how big the world of coaching is. And how your view shouldn't be narrow-minded on one or two guys. There are people here who I hadn't heard of. Oh, or, yeah. Or who I'm like, yeah, I understand, you know, um, Denver has a great program and Dave Carl, David Carl is doing well there. But him as a person and his experience and how he runs the game, like, you're learning this now. Scouting coaches, someone was like, are you guys going to do a, a coaching, a coach scouting profile or a coach's profile? I mean, in some capacity, yeah, we'll talk about them. But it's a whole different ball game. The there's inner circles and there's people in the know and they'll know of people that you'll never heard of. They'll be an assistant at a, at a different program. They'll be running a, a college program or a junior league program that doesn't win championships, but they know that that coach gets that team to overperform year in and year out. I think the, the one takeaway I would have people take, take away from this, this episode is, Broaden your horizons in terms of who you would expect and who you would, you know, a want or root for and understand that there's a really good chance that this is going to come from perceivably left field. John Tortorella. Oh, <laughs> and then we'll be having this conversation again in three years, <laughs> but it'll be a fun three years until then. The content factory would never stop producing. So I think last point here before we jump into our interview with Max and Prashant, Europe. There are coaches, there are European coaches over in Europe, and there's North American coaches also over in Europe, thinking of Cam Abbott. Um, you know, Ricard Gronberg, who we've had on this podcast, Roger Ronberg, who's uh, a coach in obviously a great program in Falunda, um, Cam Abbott, who will be familiar with Moritz Sider from Rogla, Sergei Fedorov, who obviously just won big in, in – uh, <laughs> And in, in only Sergei Fedorov style in the KHL and then Igor Larionov, who we've talked about forever. And that just scratches the surface. There's a lot over there. Considering the Red Wings European youth and core, 
considering Lidstrom was just brought in and he was he's very connected to the the program over there in Sweden as well. He's based out of there most of the time. Is this the time where we see that connection come over manifest in, in, in uh, manifesting in a head coach or even an assistant coach position? Definitely, maybe. No, it's a dumb answer, but it's, it's more possible, I think, than ever. Yeah, and you know the Red Wings obviously moved in on the Blaschel decision quickly. They have all the time in the world, not literally, but they have a lot of time to make this decision. They can interview dozens of candidates if they so choose and want to take on that workload. They'd be dumb not to interview some Europeans. They'd be dumb to not interview junior coaches. They'd be dumb to not interview NCAA coaches. If they think that there's a person out there who is, who could be good for the Red Wings, interview them. You never know what you'll find. Do your research. Do your due, due diligence. I think the Red Wings have all the way up till almost the draft to make this decision, truthfully, if they really, really want to have a thorough uh, search. Now, they could also have it done in like two weeks. That's entirely up to Stevie. But it'll likely be announced right when we hit record on this. Publish, yeah. Yeah, yeah. honestly. You've no. hit you hit record, right? Yeah, I did. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. I'm not starting that over. <laughs> no, uh, next Wednesday, I have another long drive ahead of me. So oh, let's yeah, plan that, for that that's when good. it's happening. Um, I uh, was a hockey instructor from the ages of 14 to 17, so maybe I have a chance. You certainly have I a know chance. how to develop the youth. How did those kids turn out? I have no idea. All in prison now. Probably. <laughs> because of you. Beg, like, listen, keep a boot knife in your skates. <laughs> when that kid comes out front, you shank him in the kidneys. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> they played junior C then. Got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah, I, I think the point here is there is a lot of there are a lot of options and there's a broad horizon in terms of time as well where this can take place. So... It's going to boil down to a question of philosophy from Eisenman in terms of what he wants. And I think we're going to, uh, that's going to become apparent, apparent, obviously, once we see what the hire is. So before we jump into the interview, I first want to let everyone know that this episode of the Winged Wheel podcast is proudly brought to you by the FanDuel Sportsbook, a sponsor that gives Red Wings fans uh, what we really need right now, even more excitement in the game. There's so many reasons why FanDuel is America's number one sportsbook. They're simple to use with great odds on different betting markets, giving you more action every game day. They're also tons of fun with unique bet types like same game parlay and exclusive promos on the biggest events. And when you win, you get your winnings back safely in as little as 24 hours. Now listen to this. FanDuel is letting you place your first bet risk-free up to $1,000. Just place a bet on any game and FanDuel will refund you up to $1,000 back in site credit if you don't win that first bet. If you win, you keep the cash. If you lose, you get up to $1,000 back in site credit. Now what we want you to do is download the FanDuel Sportsbook app to get started with that risk-free bet and be sure to sign up with the promo code WWP so they know the Winged Wheel podcast sent you. That's FanDuel Sportsbook promo code WWP. You must be 21 and older and present in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, West Virginia, Indiana, Colorado, Iowa, Tennessee, Virginia, or Michigan. First online real money wager only. Site credit is non-withdrawable and expires in 14 days. Restrictions apply. See sportsbook.fanduel.com for details. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-522-4700 in Colorado, 1-800-BETS-OFF in Iowa, 1-800-9-WITH-IT in Indiana, 1-800-GAMBLER in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Illinois, or Virginia, Tennessee Redline 1-800-889-9789, 1-800-GAMBLER.net, West Virginia, or call 1-800-270-7117 in Michigan. Okay, we're now going to jump into our uh, conversation that we had with Max Boltman of The Athletic Detroit and Prashant Iyer, uh, our good friends who uh, were gracious enough to stay up late and uh, help digest this Jeff Blashill information uh, and news with us, as well as take a look ahead at, uh, at uh, what might be next for Steve Eisman, the Detroit Red Wings, the Iser plan, and all of those different uh, coaching options that we just dove into a little bit with you. So uh, without further ado, enjoy that interview. So. Max, I'm to understand that you have a vacation coming up. Yeah. And we got the news of Jeff Blashill's uh, not contract not being extended today. So it stands to reason that one of the following two things is true. One, you have paid for the luxury of this news coming out before your vacation so you can enjoy it like a normal person. Or two... A monster mega trade is coming while you're overseas or or uh, enjoying the sun on the beach. Well, I, uh, it's certainly not the former. So well, bring your laptop with you. I, I will. <laughs> Did you just right, preemptively folks. write an article about like seven different Tyler Bertuzzi trade destinations? 
Well, it's it'll, it'll be in May. So I think what's more likely is like a new coach hire happening then than a, than a trade per se. But look, I'm I'm, I'm going to be preparing for all scenarios and I, there's a decent chance I end up working from the beach. That Maurice Sider draft really ruined you, huh? Uh, I'm not pre-writing ever again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Folks, uh, today is as good a day as any to get the gang uh, all together for this. Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Plus, uh, Max Baltman of The Athletic Detroit, as well as Prashant Iyer. Guys, thanks for joining. And, uh, well, like I said before, we don't need a format for this one. All right. Let's get some initial reactions. So we're recording this on Saturday night. Uh, earlier today, it was announced that Steve Eisenman and the Detroit Red Wings wouldn't be extending the contracts of Jeff Blashill as well as Doug Huda and um, Jeff Seleko. What were your initial reactions? Max, you can start. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think it was a huge shocker considering the way that the, the season ended. I think, you know, the, the start the Red Wings got out to uh, early in the year, certainly. If you, if you told us this uh, in December, I think it would have been a surprise. But uh, after the way the last couple of months went, I think they gave up five or more goals 15 times since late February. Uh, obviously had the 11-goal game, the 10-goal game, the 9-goal game. Uh, Again, you start to add those things up and, you know, at the end of the day, this, this, you could kind of see something like this coming. Um, Ron, I think you, you said it well on, on Twitter today. Like, you know, Jeff Blaschel is a really respected hockey coach and I think he will work again in the NHL at some point. But after seven years with the Red Wings, uh, to have the season finish like this and what was maybe the first season, um, since the, the start of the rebuild that they seem to be trending upward early, um, I, I, I don't think it's a huge surprise. One thing that, uh, I, I thought about today was, you know, the Red Wings finished eighth last in the league and, uh, I don't think it's necessarily the eighth loss finishing, but like you said, Max, it's just how bad they lost. If the Red Wings trajectory, you know, wins and losses went exactly as it did all season, but every one of those mega losses was just closer. It was a 7-4 game or a 5-2 game rather than, you know, a 9 or 10-11 goal tune-up. I don't think we're having this conversation, and I would go so far as to say it is a certainty that, well, it's Steve Eisman. We can't know what he's thinking, but I would think it's pretty likely that Jeff Blashill is returning. Is that fair to say? I don't know. I mean, I, I like you said, it's it's hard to read his mind. I think, I like I like I said, I, I think it, er, the way it was going early, yeah, I, I think it, you probably would have seen it, it continue, but um, it it didn't, and it it didn't for a long stretch, and and you know, even at the end, I th- you know, I thought s- some guys kind of got their groove back, Alex Adelkovich being one of them. Uh, but it still just didn't look like the same team from early in the year. And you think back to, I know it's probably a little cliche by this point, but the, the, the shift in the Florida game where I really felt like this is an identity that the Red Wings have carved out, like the way that they, they handled that shift and they were um, playing with and sometimes beating good teams. And you started to see kind of a formula for, okay, this can work. And, and it kind of answered, I think, some of the questions about why did the Red Wings um, play the way they did, sometimes too conservatively over the recent years, because they thought that kind of identity was something they could win with it evaporated in the second half. And so all of a sudden you don't have that identity and, and you don't have, you know, the offensive firepower. And all of a sudden, rather than playing, you know, three, two, four, three games, you're, you know, I, I don't, I'm not trying to repeat the nine, two or whatever, but it, there was plenty that it was five, one, six, one, stuff like that. And um, that's not a way to live in the NHL. It's certainly not a way to, to develop talent either when, when you're in all those losing games all the time. So um, I, I think I agree with you. I think it was the the magnitude of the losses and, and kind of the, the, the way that they played out more than anything um, that, that ultimately led to kind of this outcome. Prashant, as the curator of uh, all of those stats that, you know, they were fun to wake up to some days in the group chat. You saw, you saw statistical insight into just how bad the season was going. What do you make of this uh, non-renewal or de facto firing and, and what's next for the Red Wings? You know, I mean, I have to echo what Max said and where, like the, the the writing was on the wall because at least to me this felt like the first time the wings actually had a reasonable amount of talent on the roster and the first half of the season maybe was almost his undoing in the sense that like you saw what the team could be when they were competitive when they were engaged and i don't know if it was just sort of injury the the, the crunch schedule the number of other things that came up throughout the season but you know the wheels really fell off to the point where they were being blown out by historic proportions, things we haven't seen in 20 years, 30 years, 
um, from a single hockey team. And, and this was supposed to be a team that was taking strides forward that I think at the end of the day, it ended up just being too much. Like uh, there, there was just not enough positives to overcome some of those alarming statistics that I tossed out throughout the year. I mean, you know, you look at the number of times they lost by five plus something we haven't seen since 95, 96, you know, the number of times they gave up seven plus goals, also something we haven't seen in 25 years. Um, you know, franchise worse going back to 85, 86. It was just too much to overcome. So we won't talk, I think, about what's next for Blasha. Like you said, Max, you referred to what we were talking about on Twitter. He's a pretty well-respected guy within the league, and I think there's work for him in the NHL. If, if that's something he wants, I could also see him going the NCAA route. But let's talk about, you know, this vacancy in Detroit. Uh, Max, you're a machine. You're you have this, I think the cycle is down pat. Major news happens. You pump out a quality article in record time, and then you jump on for an interview when we don't even give you time to have dinner, really. So uh, you put out a, a, an article today on The Athletic Detroit that everyone should should go read. I mean, really, if you're listening to this, go read that first. Uh, but it's the headline is Red Wings head coach candidates who could replace Jeff Blashill. And there is a wealth, a wealth of coaches to choose from. Um, do any names stick out to you or, or even just kind of a coaching style that either of you think is is what the Red Wings should be looking for here? Yeah, I think a lot of the names stick out to me. And, and frankly, I think there's probably more names that belong on it. And at some point, I just had to start printing them and, and publishing them and, and not sitting on it and, and looking for more, right? Like, if anything, I think the NHL section of that article is a little thin. Um, it, it, it's mainly headlined by Lane Lambert and Travis Green. Um, Lane Lambert, I think, obviously has been a, a topic for a while around any potential Red Wings vacancy, even when there hasn't been one. Um, people have, have looked at him as a potential replacement for Jeff Blaschel for a couple of reasons. Number one, the familiarity with Steve Eiserman. But I, I think that's secondary to the fact that he's learned from Barry Trotz. He's been Barry Trotz's right-hand man for the last 10 years. To me, there's not five better coaches in the NHL than Barry Trotz. He's got an excellent track record. Um, and, and so to pull basically his top lieutenant away, I think would be a really significant addition. And I think he's, he's one of the top names for that reason. Um, Green's on there, I think, because he's kind of done exactly what this position is going to be that Detroit has open, which is to take a rebuild from the accumulation phase um, into the next step, which is the playoffs. He did that with Vancouver. He didn't get them any further and he got fired. So I can understand people saying, well, hey, if, it, if he didn't finish the job there, does he deserve it in Detroit? That's all well and good. The other name I've got in that NHL group is Jim Montgomery, who obviously that's a whole other situation, but just a name that I do think you'll probably start hearing associated with more openings. And so I, I included him, but I thought a lot of the names that were the most interesting to me were outside of the NHL. Ben Gruel, uh, Ben Wagruel is the uh, head coach of the Syracuse Crunch, which of course is the Tampa Bay farm system. So I Eiserman would have been um, in charge there when he was hired. Uh, Julian Breezebois has been quoted as calling him a hockey genius. And we know obviously Eisenman and Breezebois have quite the history. We can probably assume that that's a pretty big endorsement coming from him. I think that's a really interesting one. Um, Chicago Wolves are the top team in the AHL this year. Ryan Warsawski is their head coach. He also was an assistant on the uh, 2019 Charlotte Checkers team that won the Calder Cup. That was uh, Alex and Delkovich's team, uh, for those who remember that. Um, Mitch Love is, is the head coach of the Stockton Heat, took them from last place in the Canadian division this year to first place in the Pacific uh, in his first year as an AHL coach. Before that, he was with Saskatoon. He's got a long history with Hockey Canada. Um, I, he might be a little young. I think he's only 37, and, and we'll see um, if, if you know if, if his time for the NHL is now or, or down the line. But he's kind of had my attention for about a year. Um, David Carl is a guy at, at Denver University, just won the national championship. Red Wings are going to know him real well because he's got three of their prospects, Carter Mazur, Antti Tuomisto, and Shai Buyam, uh, and obviously just won the national championship, beating two – this is what interests me in, in particular is they won the national championship, and, and they had to do it by beating two super different teams, a, a super talented uh, Michigan team that had four of the top five picks in the NHL draft, super explosive. They beat them in a tight overtime game. Then, you know, two days later, they come back and they play Minnesota State, which is the epitome of kind of what you typically think of as a college hockey tournament team, tight checking, super veteran, super structured. They beat them five to one. So to me, the fact that they were able to do both, super impressive. David Carl's even younger. I think he's 32, um, but that's impressive. And the WHL, Dennis Williams 
is a coach who's had a really nice run in Everett uh, in, the, in the in the Western League, and then there's there's a whole host of guys um, over in Europe that I will let some of the other guys talk about here because I don't want to bogart all of them, and uh, a lot of the people have really smart things to say here on this call. So I'm going to shut up now and, and turn this over to Prashant and Brad. I mean, you know, Max, just go go, go right ahead, right? Um... No, I mean, I definitely I'll, what I'll do is I'll highlight a couple of the names that I think you said. And I, you know, Brad, I know you've got some opinions on some of the European coaches. So, you know, I'll let you uh, take those there. I think a couple of names I like to highlight really is just how good David Carl's been, you know, at, at Denver. I think obviously, you know, Wings fans are coming to know him winning the, the championship this year. But, um, you know, if you look at sort of the, the advanced metrics over the course of the last four years where he's been at Denver, um, you know, the worst his team has done from like a five on five course C4 percentage is like 58%. Like his teams dominate other teams. Um, they've been ridiculously good, um, you know, over the last three years. In fact, he's never had a team worse than 50, per, uh, you know, 51% um, in his four years at Denver. So it's been really, really impressive to see kind of the system that he's put into place. And then I think the other one that I'll plug is Ryan Warsawski from Chicago. You know, we don't get as much data at the AHL level, at least made publicly, but we can look at goals for percentage, which is crude, less than ideal, but it's the best thing we probably got for the AHL. And his Chicago and Charlotte teams, going back to when uh, the affiliate was in Charlotte, never been worse than 54% goals for percentage. And so, uh, including the last three years, have been all north of 58%. So he's a really, really strong coach uh, that seems to get a lot of offense out of his team. So I think those are a couple of the names uh, in the U.S. and in and, and North America that stand out to me. So I actually want to talk to you guys about something a little more philosophical. Because on our podcast a few weeks ago, we were talking about how generally you want to hire a coach that fits your team. By the time the Red Wings are contenders, most of this roster is not going to be there. So we don't know what type of team the Red Wings are going to be by the time they're winning. So... If you had, you know, carte blanche and you can hire a European coach, an unproven AHL coach, a veteran coach, like you just laid out a lot of the guys from the AHL and, and whatnot. And, you know, obviously there's different types of former NHL coaches on the market everywhere from like a John Tortorella to a Paul Maurice. What What is the approach here? Not fully knowing what type of team the Red Wings are going to be. Yeah. I mean, that's a ter tremendous question. I think if you're the Red Wings, I think there's a couple of things that are going to be really important to you. I think first and foremost is a coach that can kind of preserve that culture um, of, of the Red Wings, um, kind of what, the, what they've done over the last 30 years. I think we've seen that, that it has to be someone who carries himself well, someone who can connect with the players, someone who can kind of uphold that aura, someone who can not afraid of that challenge, and someone who is – committed to bringing that success and, and winning mentality to the Red Wings. So that's going to be something that I think is at the forefront of what they're looking for. And then the second thing to me is, is someone who's almost willing to come in with, with different ideas. I think you saw that with Blaschel this past year, going out and kind of bringing in Alex Tangay. And, you know, sure enough, Alex Tangay is the last remaining man, likely because he was the only one who didn't have his contract expiring, but I will I will believe that it's because he was of a different mentality and different mindset, and that's why the Wings wanted to go out and get him. And so someone who is uh, not just going to be a, a run-of-the-mill um, you know, guy, someone who's going to come in when, with innovative ideas. And then the third thing that I think the Wings are going to be looking for is with their really young core right now, um, someone who can connect with the players and sort of manage um, the personalities, I think, more than anything else. I think we sometimes discount – how important it is to be able to connect and manage personalities as a coach um, in professional sports, not just, um, you know, the NHL, but really across all sports. And so I think that may be why um, in recent years, we've seen a lot of these AHL guys be able to come up um, and have success. You know, we think of Jay Woodcroft and Edmonton and what he's doing right now. Um, you know, there's a couple, handful of other guys. I think Derek King was uh, AHL. Um, but yeah, just a number of different guys that, I think have the ability to connect with the players. And I think that's going to be something important. I think a lot of the kind of the, the non NHL sources are interesting this year too, because 
most of those leagues have a demand that is not just winning, right? Like junior hockey, a lot of it is, you know, they, they want to win, but they want to develop players and you are kind of building towards something. The AHL is certainly a developmental league. I know um, sometimes people be critical of prospects not playing enough in certain situations, but the whole structure of the league is set up so that prospects get the bulk of the ice time um, and, and, and you're focused a lot on individual development. I think that's relevant to the Red Wings. Absolutely. And so I think um, when you find someone who's been able to balance that, when you've been able to, to, win in that developmental setting um, it's kind of your perfect marriage because I don't think the Red Wings um, I, I think they should start thinking about winning soon but but they're only going to get there by um, continuing to bring along really good young players and I think that matters um, but I, I also think that, you know that there's merit in, in people who have seen you know like like Elaine Lambert seen you know, winning hockey at the highest level for a, a long period of time and seeing kind of what works and um, what works once doesn't work every time and it doesn't work forever. So I, I also, you know, certainly like when I talked about David Carl and the ability to win in two different kinds of game, um, that that really resonated with me because it says, you know, hey, this is someone who is not just set in one way of doing things. They can kind of put it together for for whatever it's going to look like um, or at least to beat multiple different kinds of opponents, you know, and so um, there's that. But yeah, to, to your question, Brad, I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily matter. It doesn't have to be one specific, you know, uh, shape or, or kind of stencil that, that you're looking for here. It's just, just a guy who can really succeed and uh, maybe the more different kinds of um, settings you've seen him have success in, I guess I would say the better, but um, that that's the bottom line. I don't think it has to be done one specific way. So a thought that's been floating through my head that I, I'd love to get your takes on is there are always so many barriers to European coaches coming over to the NHL and knowing the, that the Red Wings core, the, the real core is, is Maurice Sider, Lucas Raymond, hopefully Simon Edvinson coming over next year uh, in whatever capacity. That is a obviously a large uh, European contingent all coming through the SHL in some capacity. Is that as good of a bridge as you're ever going to get between an NHL team and a coach like Roger Ronberg, like Ricard Gronberg coming over. And does that make it even in the territory of likely that this could happen, you know, considering all of the candidates over there uh, that Eisman brings one of them over? I don't know that I would say likely. I definitely think they have one of the more conducive setups to, to trying it. And we've seen NHL teams be real hesitant to, to go to that pool. Like, it's probably one of the most undertapped pools of of uh, coaching talent that I can think of is is Europe. When you consider how much good hockey is played over there and how much success the European nations have in in hockey, both in producing NHL players and also in, in tournaments on the world stage, it is surprising to me that there's not more of it. And I think the Red Wings have the setup when you talk about how many Swedes they're going to have in particular, um, to and, and including in their management team now with with Nick Littstrom to doing something like that. Um, and certainly by having that many prospects, you, you'd think they've been exposed to these guys at a kind of a deeper level too, right? Like you'd think maybe they're a little more familiar with, with a Roger Romberg or a Cam Abbott, who actually is North American. He's just coaching in, in Sweden. Um, but, you know, one way or the other, it's, you know, I think they probably have the the uh, familiarity there and, and maybe maybe it helps the comfort level. But I, I still wouldn't call it likely, but I definitely think maybe more likely than, you know, a team that isn't in their position, I guess I would say. Yeah, I mean – you know, Ryan, it's a really good question to ask because uh, this was something I looked into as we were trying to figure out, um, you know, European coaches. I mean, it's been 22 years since a European was hired to coach in the NHL. 2000 was the last time there were two coaches hired, um, one by Chicago, one by Pittsburgh. It hasn't happened since then. Um, it clearly seems to be a, a transition for that, for whatever reason, is, like you said, Max, very undertapped. I mean, I think in recent years, we've we've seen it play out well, or at least more often in the management sphere. You know, you think of Yarmo in Columbus, you think of, I think, Patrick Olivan in, in, in Vancouver, Ralph Kruger, you know, came over a little bit in Edmonton. Um, I think those are some guys there. But maybe, you know, one of the guys that's the first to do it is a guy who has that familiarity at the NHL level and now is an international guy, maybe like Ole Okunen. Uh, you know, played for a long time for Florida um, in the NHL and then now is coaching in Finland. And potentially he's a guy that is the bridge to come back. I think Marco Sturm is coaching uh, the German World Junior team. And then, you know, all of our favorites, Sergei Fedorov is another guy that can potentially be out there and uh, as a guy that can maybe bridge that gap. But that's kind of 
I think that's going to be the type of person that does this and maybe breaks that mold of 20 plus years of, you know, going in between those two hirings. Can we talk about Fedorov? Because, I mean, like the fact that this happened on the day that he wins the KHL championship, the Gagarin Cup, <laughs> like coming back from down 3-1, uh, a little eerie, is it not? <laughs> A little prophetic. What are you? What are you trying to say, Max? What do you know? Well, it's just a little weird, and and I think you know ultimately when you look at you know an iconic Red Wings figure who was on all these championship teams with all these guys the Red Wings have brought back, goes and wins the the, the championship in in his first season. Like it's a little Hollywood, to be honest. And and I, what I want to know is like you know certainly the fact he's only coached in in that league for one year. I guess you can say um, the track record of, of coaching isn't as long. But I think that does necessarily get mitigated when it's a guy who has the experience playing at as high a level and for as long as Sergei Fedorov did. Like, would you guys be comfortable with Sergei, Sergei Fedorov as the head coach? Honestly, what Martin St. Louis did in Montreal helps. Uh, the, the jury's still out. I don't think Montreal is as good as everybody's given them credit for. But obviously, with what he did with Cole Caulfield alone... Um, gives me confidence because Sergey tried a lot of weird things in Russia that worked. And I'm, I'm a fan of different try whatever. And, and if Sergey's the guy that's going to come over and bring a unique perspective, a unique system, you know, pull the goalie in overtime and crazy things like that, I'm all for it. And it's probably worth noting his banner hasn't been raised yet in Detroit. So if he comes back as the coach, they do that game one. That could be, that could be a moment. It's so Hollywood, you're not wrong, but look what we've had so far. Steve Eisman returning, what was it? it was April 19th, right? It was the 19, like the day was 19. Steve Eisman returned, it was this whole year thing. year 19. We, yeah, that we begged for forever. Uh, and then Nick Littstrom has returned in an executive role. I would love to say it's the director of scouting. Yeah, I'd love to say it's too Hollywood, but that's what we've had so far, so why count it out? And Brad, what you just said about raising the banner first, <laughs> tinfoil hat. They knew the whole time it was going to be fetter off eventually, and that's why they saved the banner. Well, but that is, I would say, one of the best arguments to say, look, is this is this too much of a leap? Because if, if ownership isn't raising the, the jersey of a guy who I think everyone on this podcast agrees deserves to be in the rafters, right? It, so if, if they're not doing that with what should be such a slam dunk, uh, is it really reasonable to think that they would – bring that same person in as head coach. I don't know, but that's probably one of the best cases to say, maybe we are overreacting. And I mean, I think the other thing to add to that is, I guess there is obviously the political aspect of, are you going to be able to bring him over? Um, you know, at least right now, I don't know the circumstances and how all of this is going to work. I can't even get on the freaking KHL stats page right now to even see how well his team's performing. And so I don't, I don't know, but the Wings did it once in 1989, and let's see what happens again. So, Sergey having to defect to Detroit <laughs> twice would sure be something. <laughs> There's, uh, and and I mean, hey, if they want to take the safer route, not discounting the obviously geopolitical uh, barriers here, but if coaching experience is something that we want, but we still want kind of the uh, the storyline, the Hollywood Igor, Igor Larionos right there too. So, it, a, a wealth of options. I want to talk about the team a little bit here. And Max, this is something that you and I, I remember we talked about a long time ago, and I think you've touched on in some articles and things. Uh, a team feels like they failed when their coach gets let go. And, you know, especially considering the kind of diehard captain that Dylan Larkin is and the seasons that Sider and Raymond just had where, where Blashill gave them every single opportunity to have their Calder level seasons. How is this going to impact the team and, and what changes for them going into next season? It's a great question. And certainly, obviously, some of the things that we are planning to talk to, uh, of all these guys about when, when the Red Wings kind of have their, it's, it's end of season availabilities this week. It, with, with Larkin's injury, we'll see kind of what that looks like. I would still hope that, that we get a chance to talk to him, but I don't know how that's gone for him so far. And, uh, I don't know where he's at in that process, but they're, they're really good questions. And I think ultimately, you know, a lot of times you see a team have a, bit of a jolt right after the, the coach is fired. And I think sometimes it's attributed to, um, you know, oh, the new voice is really getting through, but sometimes it may just be because there was a big wake up call and, um, it happening at the end of the year. I don't know if it quite works the same way there, but, you know, 
certainly I think it, it probably is a, is a reminder that, you know, nobody's set in stone anywhere. And um, when, when the team does get back next season, um, you know, maybe it's, it's enough of like a change that, that it kind of, you know, wakes up, um, wakes up some of the guys on, on, on a deeper level. I don't know, but um, ultimately what, what I think coming out of this is the Red Wings need to make sure that um, whoever the next coach is, that they don't just have that good vibes of a new voice boost coming into this. I think they need to be able to actually kind of build momentum. And, and that's going to be by adding more than just a new coach. It's going to be by adding new players. And it doesn't mean they, they have to keep the entire roster and only add. You can still subtract. But just if you're going to subtract, add in other places or add two so that you can still get new, you know, what feels like momentum in, right? Like like Buffalo, I think of Buffalo and they're rebuilding. And, you know, they got a new coach in there and, and they actually traded the guy who was at the center of their entire long-term vision during the season. And that was Jack Eichel. And when they did it, you know, it was like, a, oh my gosh, moment, right? But they also got back players who could help them pretty much right away in Alex Tuck and Peyton Krebs. And I think those two guys are big reasons why, despite the fact Buffalo missed the playoffs again, I got a pretty good feeling about Buffalo coming out of this, right? Like, I think that it's pretty good vibes coming out of um, out of that team this year, despite the fact that they finished, what, one point better than the Red Wings? So I, I think that's kind of a important takeaway is that, you know, as you get a new coach in here, you know, give them new players too and, and, and give them, you know, give the players new teammates and, and don't, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, spend top dollar and, and throw caution to the wind with your rebuild, but make it feel like, hey, things are really changing because I think, you know, it, it can't just be from, from the coach at the front of the room. Am, am I off base there, guys? No. I, I don't think you're off base at all. I mean, I think at some point, you know, there is a staleness to a message, uh, you know, regardless of how long someone's been there. I mean, Barry Trotz is in Nashville for, what, 16, 17 years. But, and eventually there's a staleness to the message, despite the fact that his team's never really, you know, went poorly. I mean, he, he was actually only a couple years removed from taking Nashville – um, you know, to the Stanley Cup Finals before he leaves there. From remembering my uh, my timeline correctly on, on on Trot, so you know, it. I think things have to change, and and it's you know, I think at some point it's beyond just one single aspect where things need to need to change. It's got to change with the players. It's got to change with the coaching staff, and Eisman has to do everything he can to put them, you know, put these guys in a position to succeed. Um, and, uh, and once he's done that, it then comes down to the players. And, you know, one of the last things he could do was change the voice in the locker room. And even if it's a guy that people like, uh, if the message isn't resonating and you're not extracting as much out, you know, that has to change. And then you have to find some other guys in there who are willing to come in and, and, and maybe shake up, um, you know, that locker room vibe. An uncomfortable question I have is... And this might be getting into a little bit of the territory of what you're writing about, Prashanth. So uh, feel free to not spoil anything. Um, the Red Wings, essentially, a lot of people think that they have a decision to make in terms of this rebuild. You're either looking to improve now, you like really improve and, and you know be in that conversation to at least be a, a not crazy team to bring up for a, a playoff spot, or you look at the supposedly, you know, franchise level talents coming through next draft and you say we're going to we're going to move this rebuild back we're going to move our core back to our younger guys and we're going to mortgage away those players for futures and try to capitalize on next year's draft and then maybe we go is that a really tough decision to make now knowing that you have a new coach coming in and especially with what you just said max like you can't do to this coach what blashell had which is you know he had god-awful teams to work with is that a really tough situation for Eisenman and co to be in? Yeah. I mean, this is certainly not an easy scenario. And, and like you laid out, Ryan, I think you have to make sure that uh, whatever decision you make, whether it's, I think Max, you laid it out in the article, you tear down a little bit more and it's more uncomfortable to do so, but you go that direction because you're, you're, you're sort of playing your way to the 2023, um, you know, uh, top of the draft or the other option is to try and shoot for the moon. I think, if you try to put the coach in a position where expectations have changed and you now want to ramp up, then I do think that is maybe adding a little bit more pressure, um, you know, to a new coach coming in. But at the same time, the wings can't really afford another three, four years of just 
sitting and waiting and sort of allowing things to, to, to buy time for a particular coach. I think we used that message a lot when Eisenman first came in that he said it was going to be five years. And so you really had to give some patience with him and Blaschel. But I think, at least in my opinion, the this move signals, signals a change. It'll signal change in aggression from the front office that I think will need to be carried down. And that does mean the seat's going to be warmer a little bit earlier than it was for Jeff Blaschel when Eisenman first came on. I think that's at least how I perceive the, the scenario to play out. And you know what? Don't you think that's a good thing for the new coach too, right? Like it, it's not, no coach is going to like seek the hot seat or whatever, but like how many times did we hear you can't judge the Red Wings off of wins and losses? Well, you know what? If I'm a coach, I kind of freaking want to be judged by wins and losses at some point because I want to win, you know? You, you don't want moral victories? Like moral victories aren't what leads you to the promised land here? I mean – you know, you're absolutely right, though. Like, I think if you're a coach, you want to step into the challenge. And if you're stepping into the Red Wings locker room, you have talented players. I mean, you have the likely Calder winner and in, in more insider. You've got, uh, you know, a goaltending prospect and an Alex Nadelkovich, who uh, seems to have some some uh, talent there. And then obviously you've got all the forwards up front and, and Larkin, Raymond, Verana, Bertuzzi and and so you step into that locker room, you you better want to win and you better feel like you can win. And so I do think it's a good thing to to have that shift in expectations. And I think that's what's going to happen. But, you know, if, you, if you're if you Steve Eiserman, you have to decide, are you going to try and be like New Jersey this past offseason, add a whole bunch and have it backfire on you? Uh, or are you going to try and bide your time? Or are you going to try and more smartly play this um, and sort of see how the draft lottery plays out and then sort of go from there? It's a, it's really tough to, to to make a decision now. So if we look at this from the coach's perspective and, and you're presented two options, you take the Red Wings as they are now, you add a couple pieces in the offseason, maybe you're a little aggressive and then obviously whatever impact that would have on the long term. So you're a coach walking into a team, obviously on the rise, Eisman fills in a couple of the holes and you go, okay, get us close to the playoffs this year. We were, you know, how many spots out this year? We want to improve on that. Or let's say Eisman does the opposite this summer. Where there's a Tyler Bertuzzi trade. A couple of the veterans aren't brought back and you get a much younger core. But the roster takes a step back. But then you're pitching to the new coach. This is very firmly the core of our future. You have Raymond Sider. We'll say Larkin, even though he's older. Edmondson's coming in and, and you're going to have this wealth of prospects coming up. You have carte blanche to mold this team how you want. And this is your team for the next two, three, four years. Build it into the winner, into your vision. So if you're a coach, which one of those options is more attractive to walk into? Well, so here's what I think about the second option that you said is that as long as it would happen before game one, like, like any sub, if I'm the new coach, any subtracting that's going to be done to my roster, other than, you know, pending UFAs or whatever, like stuff that like it, it happens. And I, I realize there's a couple of big pending UFAs that maybe, uh, need to get exempted from this because I think, uh, I think they're obviously to make their decisions there this summer personally. Like I, I think you extend, um, or, or deal in, in the summer, to be honest. Um, Eiserman clearly has way more of a stomach for, for riding through a season with that kind of like cloud hanging over his head than I ever would. And it's one of the billion reasons that I am a writer and not an executive. Uh, but, I, to me, if I'm the new coach coming in, I don't want any subtract. I, I want as few subtractions as possible once the games start. You can subtract if you still want to this summer, and then everything from there is going to be basically going from ground zero. But uh, to me, once the season starts, I don't want guys coming out and, and then the rest of the room feeling like, oh, here we go again. Because ultimately, I think that's one of the big culprits for why the second half tanked off so bad this year is – it, it was that, oh, here we go again. And it, it wasn't just the trade deadline, but the trade deadline was absolutely a part of it. So if I'm the new coach, that's one of the, that's one of my main asks is like, if you're going to take guys out it, to the whatever degree that you can try to do it before the games start it's a, so that it's, it's, it's not a deja vu and, and a letdown in the middle of the year. That'd be my take. What do you think? I think for me, I would absolutely not want to have a scenario too as a, as a coach stepping into a new gig. Um, and having a bunch of guys subtracted right in the off season, even if it may change what the expectations are for me, and even if we recognize that Steve Eisenman is a very patient coach, 75% of the current NHL coaches have been there with their teams for three years or less. Huh. You are not getting a leash, right? There, there are only eight head coaches in the NHL right now that have been in a head coach for their team 
for more than three years. So if I want to step into a scenario, I don't want to be stepping into a scenario that's a four or five year rebuild, knowing that there's a pretty darn good chance I'm not going to be around for when things actually get good. All right. Any final thoughts on today? Anything from uh, discourse on whether or not Blashill had had the right opportunity to, you know, all of those guys that you listed out as potential replacements in your article, Max, or, or what's next for this team? Uh, any parting thoughts before we wrap up the interview? Well, I just hope people have can have a nuanced view of his tenure and time, right? Like, I, I, I think, you know, at the end of the day, his, his record is going to um, be what people remember him for. And, and he was he's always going to be the guy that was at the helm for what to a lot of fans, certainly fans that are most of our age, is one of the toughest periods in Red Wings history. And, and that's unavoidable. But I, I do hope people can have a balanced view of it at the end of the day and, and see this was a this was ultimately a good person who really cared about their job. Uh, they, they didn't really have great circumstances for success for most of the tenure. And at the end of the day, I do think he deserves some credit for what he provided in terms of bringing along some of the guys who are their cornerstones right now. And that being Dylan Larkin, Tyler Bertuzzi, Lucas Raymond, Moritz Sider, he had less time with, but he was still part of that. And, and I do hope that people can at some point and on some level appreciate that. I, I think this is someone who I really respect and I've enjoyed covering for, for the entire time that I have. And I, I think it's okay to have that while still recognizing that at the end of the day, it it didn't get where it, where it needed to go for him to continue. And I think that's okay to have a legacy that that's balanced and nuanced that way. And so um, that's my opinion on it. And I, I think fans are certainly entitled to have their feelings, um, you know, be a little different than that, or, or maybe even outweigh some of the um, some of the context and the nuance there. That's, that's what makes fandom great. Right. But um, that'd be my, I guess my takeaway. Yeah. I mean, I think I would be very much along those same lines. Uh, you sort of think about when Blashell took over in 2015, and you think about some of the moves that were made right at the beginning of his tenure. The, the Justin Abdelkader seven-year extension comes November 2015 at the very beginning there. Uh, you know, the you, you have a number of misses in the draft in 2015, 2016, 2017, you have Pavel Datsuk leaving you a year earlier than you were expecting, sort of forcing you to, to play with this dead cap hit. Um, and, and your front office did you no favors for the first half of your tenure. I mean, I have to be frank about that. I mean, you're handing out a six-year deal to Danny DeKaiser for $30 million. You're handing a seven-year deal you know, to Abdelkader, a six-year deal to Franz Nielsen in the 2016 offseason. You know, there, there were just a number of moves that really ate away at this team's ability to be competitive, whether it was missing draft picks or poor free agents and really until Eiserman came in and, and started to clear those contracts out and actually add back to the prospect pool, you know, expectations weren't really there and, and you couldn't really ask much more of him until this season. And I think that's where, you know, you have to have that, that perspective that this was a man dealt, you know, a pair of twos and asked, the, or I should say a two and a three at a poker table and asked to go, you know, play with the other guys who've got, you know, face cards down there. And it's like, what do you want him to do? He's not going to win the hand. He's not going to, he's not going to win one out of 10 hands. Like, it's just, it is what it is. So, but this was really the first year I thought the expectations raised and, and he didn't meet him. And, and, and that's why I think a change had to be made, but you can't blame him for a lot of the last six years. All right. So I think uh, what we have to do now, Prashanth, is coordinate to make sure someone's always at the ready when either Brad is on the highway or Max is on vacation, because that seems to be the formula here. That's the only kind of consistency we've been able to get from Steve Eisman. Folks, Prashanth Iyer and Max Boltman, uh, go read Max's work on The Athletic Detroit, and uh, we'll be chatting with you both uh, plenty coming up. But thanks for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks for having us as always, guys. Great to talk to you. You got it. And welcome back. That was our conversation with Max and Prashanth. Um, we could have gone for another hour, honestly. And I think the takeaway from you know what we covered about Blashill not returning before the interview and and listening back to that interview is, you know, it's okay to to reflect on the person and it's okay to to kind of talk about the very human elements of this. But overall, I think this adds another layer of hope. Isn't the right word. But it's another layer of excitement coming into this offseason for Red Wings fans. Like this is a reset that we haven't had as uh, in or we haven't seen with the Red Wings in years. 
in the better part of a decade. We haven't had that coaching change, especially in the context of the rebuild, right? The the Red Wings finally accepted the rebuild after Jeff Blaschel was brought on. It's funny for context. If you go back just four coaching hires ago, that was Scotty Bowman. So <laughs> it doesn't happen often. No, this is fairly unusual territory for Red Wings fans. Like Dave Lewis was short lived. Yeah. For for the Red Wings especially. Um so obviously you wish the best to to Jeff Blaschel and, and Huda and Salekel, but uh but knowing all the directions this could go and I think I think the logical approach to this is don't get married to one option and just trust that, you know, Eisman and and the management team and Lidstrom especially advising him have a plan here. Whichever direction they go is is good cause for excitement. And it's also not a guarantee that it's gonna go perfectly well either. Oh no, there's a very strong likelihood that this goes off the rails. Like it could be a, we could be right back here again next year talking yeah. about how shit the second half of the season was. That's that's NHL coaching. I think you were exactly right, Evan. That fuse is lit in the modern NHL. That fuse is lit the moment you step into the room. Jeff Blastrell was an outlier in terms of coach ex- life expectancy. The one guy ahead of him has two Stanley Cups and is about to challenge for a third. Is about to win their first round series. Oh, that's your prediction, huh? You're getting ahead we'll of to, here. That's a little teaser. Yeah. So there's uh, there's quite a bit here. This isn't the end of the, you know, Jeff Blash and what's next for the Red Wings conversation. We have a full Red Wings season postmortem season and review coming up uh, over the next couple episodes. There's plenty else that we're going to talk about. Uh, but for now, let's get into a couple smaller items before talking about the larger, uh, more exciting hockey thing here, which is the playoffs, which are starting 24 hours from the moment we're recording on Sunday night. The SHL. The NHL recently signed a new transfer agreement with the SHL um, in Sweden, and there is a notable change in there. So the previous rule was a player who was selected in the second round or later, who also had a contract in Sweden, had to be 21 before being allowed to uh, be sent to the AHL by their NHL team that drafted them. If they were younger, it was back over to Sweden. Now that rule has changed and the age has been bumped up to 24. Oh, wow. Which is, yeah, that's huge for the SHL. And that is a pretty notable hit to the, to the NHL teams who draft these guys. So if you draft an, a Swedish player in the first round, you can send them to the SHL. It doesn't it's matter. the Red Wings fault. Well, the, how much it applies to the Red Wings right now is different. Because certain guys have contracts who are expired, so it's not necessarily a right now thing. But in future, this could be problematic for teams, especially teams like the Red Wings, who tend to draft quite a few Swedes. I don't think it's going to be as big of an issue as some people are making it out to be, because you know players' contracts expire and they can come over regardless of age. It, it's only if they're under contract, and any player who has a strong desire to come over to North America will probably sign their SHL contracts with this in the back of their mind. Like, hey, maybe I don't sign a four-year deal at age 19. Maybe it's a one, two-year deal. Like, I can get over there sooner. Um, and, yeah, like, you know, it's it's only for second-round picks and later. So it's not like if you draft a very significant prospect in the first round that you're screwed. So it, it's good for the SHL, and I get it. I understand it. But, yeah, I don't think it's going to have all that much of an impact. So there's the amount that it applies again, the amount that it applies to the Red Wings is one thing right now, but I think players who have the amount of foresight to say, Hey, I'm going to be drafted in the NHL. It's likely going to be a high pick. It, a, it doesn't apply to them because if they're a first round pick, they're exempt from this rule. But you think of the Elmer Soderblom types, right? Elmer Soderblom was very much a project by no means. Could he have ever guaranteed that he'd make it over, let alone be drafted or, or the inverse, but it's, he'd be more likely to take a little bit more money, a little bit more guarantee from an SHL team who says, Hey, sign for a little bit longer. Yeah. It's a risk, but you're guaranteeing that you're playing pro hockey for the next three, four, five years, as opposed to not. And you get this extra chunk of change from us. I don't know. I, I can see the SHL leveraging this to keep their young talent for longer, which I mean, they should be doing the SHL's first interest is and should be the SHL. They're not an NHL feeder league. Like that, that's not their purpose. No, they just have some organizations that are feeder teams to other 
NHL yeah. teams. Yeah, yeah, Frolanda is Detroit's farm team. So it's not the end of the world, but I think that three-year jump is significant. I, I, I don't think that that's nothing. I think it'll be relevant to less than a half dozen players in a given year. It'll be remain. It will remain to be seen how much that applies. Um, the U18s ended today, which was speaking it, of Sweden. Yeah, pretty exciting final game. Oh yeah, Sweden's uh, goalie's probably been asleep for the last twelve hours already. Yeah, he's the game gassed. ended thirteen hours ago. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Sweden prevailed over USA in a game where I think uh, the States probably controlled play or, or, or the outright better team. But yeah, uh, they got goalied. Not to say that, that the Swedish team didn't put up a great effort, but that I think was a goalie driven championship. Yeah, they're, uh, who was it? Sweden's top line of Oslin, Ogren, and Um I believe that was the line. They all made very strong cases for why they should be first round picks uh, in the tournament today, especially. But then again, the States also did the same thing with a lot of their guys. So it was a really, really fun showcase for the upcoming draft between just two teams. Cause McGrory had a couple more goals. Isaac Howard made a couple more good plays. Like I could, I could go down the list, but yeah, it was a, a good showcase for how deep this draft is. Let's, um, Let's put that one on pause. Let's, let's put a pin in it. We're going to bring in uh, some people to talk about the U18s in more detail and what we can draw away from the U18s, especially related to the draft for a future episode. We're a little content. Yeah, our, yeah, our, today. Ne- our next like three episodes counting today are like non draft related. And then it's basically all draft content for two months. <laughs> like we're, uh, we weren't, we didn't even get a chance to talk about the Red Wings final game against the Devils. Most at our 50th point, Tyler Bertuzzi, 30th goal. Was that the first uh, Red Wings game where we had Mojo goals? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I'd have to go back and check, but that's yeah. funny. That was the real Mojo show. That was the true Mojo show. Um, and also the Detroit Red Wings have secured eighth best uh, draft lottery odds. So as of right now that they're in position eight, they have a 6% chance of getting the first overall pick. I think it was a 6.4% chance of getting the second overall pick. And a 100% chance of picking ninth and 10th. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. They're, uh, they're most likely pick as per the odds. Um, they finished behind or ahead of Buffalo behind Ottawa in terms of draft lottery odds. Their most likely pick is to stay at pick eight. Their second most likely pick is nine. Third most likely is second by, a, you know, it's 54.4% they're drafting eight, 30% per- chance they're drafting ninth, 6.4% they're drafting second. 6% chance of drafting first and 30 or 3.2% chance of drafting 10th. 10th it is. Got it. So if they're drafting 10th, that is literally less likely as per these odds in this. I'm getting this from Tankathon that mm-hmm. than them winning the draft lottery. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I hear you. So it's 10th. It's wrong. <laughs> it's, it's definitely 10th. I don't know. I'm feeling second. I'm feeling a second. Uh, second would be cool. Yeah. Uh, the draft lottery has conditioned me to think eighth would be cool. That, that would feel like a win. The Montreal Canadiens have the best lottery odds at 25.5%. Mm, and the draft's in Montreal this year. How convenient. It must be nice. All right. Should we do a simulated Hit tank? the damn button. Simulate this lottery. Da, 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 da. And the Red Wings move down one spot in draft ninth. Yep. And uh, the team that they could have replaced in the standings on Friday night won the draft lottery. <laughs> That's all right. I'm I'm not upset with the Red Wings win, especially to close up the season. The only thing that we were three minutes away from that like nightmare scenario I was oh. talking about. It got very close. Yeah. Think who says Owen Power didn't do anything for Detroit? Honestly, yeah. There was a point where sen- the Sens were losing and the Sabres were losing, and Detroit was very obviously going to win their game. And I was like, my God, they're going to move down to tenth in one fell swoop. They wouldn't move down to tenth. They would move down to ninth. Ninth, right? Yeah. But yeah. There was no chance of them uh, unseating Ottawa for seventh, and then they could have leapfrogged Buffalo. I'm like, if Detroit wins another meaningless game to hurt their draft position, like they've done so many times, I was going to snap, but nope. Buffalo <laughs> with the clutch count third period comeback and OT win. That's exactly how I wanted to happen. I, I just needed to Buffalo. If they just got one point, which is what they did and more, that's all we needed for Detroit to be secure in eighth. Anyhow, more in the draft lottery to come. That is on really May 10th. wish that game would have ended before the Red Wings game, though. Then I could have enjoyed the Red Wings game a little more. 
Well, you didn't enjoy Tyler Bertuzzi. The whole team effort to get him is 30 Oh, that was goals. great. His reaction when he shot the puck into the empty net and he hit the post initially, he dropped to his knees, like, <laughs> p- looking to the skies, like, how, how? I wonder if he has a contract bonus for 30. I don't know, but that was the most obvious example I've ever seen of a team trying to force feed someone a goal. That was more obvious than what Toronto was doing for Matthews for his 60th against Detroit the other day. <laughs> Dude, Tyler Bertuzzi was cherry picking while the devils had six players on the ice and dougie hamilton lit him up too at the red line oh, I know. He, he had to earn that goal still yeah. good i mean it was good for him if good the, for trade value now we're now i've been shopping around a 30 goal score i don't yeah, i see i do think it was a contract thing like i've never seen a player so passionate to hit that 30 goal mark it has to be a bonus it was cool it's, it's also cool to see the team come together and get that for him uh, and then one final note before talking about the playoffs here. The list of Red Wings heading to the World Championships. I mean, Jeff Blaschel. <laughs> Awkward. <laughs> wow. Jeff Blaschel, former Detroit Red Wing, okay, yeah, coaching Team go. USA. Uh, Pete Van Zandt, uh, athletic trainer. Moritz Sider P- for Germany. Uh, Pew Suter, Alex Nedeljkovic, Jacob Verana, Lucas Raymond, Philip Peronik, and Magnus Helberg. So those are all the wings heading over. Oh, yeah. Helberg played. Oh, yeah. Helberg played and won. <laughs> And he won. He, f- he played his first start with the Red Wings. Wasn't bad. Didn't look like a dumpster fire. Take that as a huge win. Yeah. If they bring him back in a backup role, great. If not, his postgame speech sounded like he wanted to come back. Uh, hey, goalie not in the NHL wants an NHL job. Weird how that works. Hot take. Okay. The playoff matchups are set. The brackets are in. Uh, patrons, we have two leagues open. We have our usual league for the... Uh, the uh, relevant tiers and above who join, and that's where all the mega prizes are. We're going to throw one of our custom podcast flannels in there, uh, jerseys, whatnot. And then we also have one open to all patrons, which will also have some prizes as well. And it's cool to have a dub dub club wide um, NHL bracket challenge league. So fill out your NHL brackets or NHL bracket challenge brackets, submit it to uh, one or both leagues, depending on what you're eligible for and see, uh, see how you do, especially competing against the hosts. So the playoff matchups are set, and they are as follows. Colorado against Nashville, Minnesota against St. Louis, Calgary against Dallas, and Edmonton facing off against the Kings, and those are in the West. And in the East, Florida versus Washington, Toronto versus Tampa Bay, Carolina versus Boston, and New York versus Pittsburgh in the East. Where do we want to start? Don't care. Western Conference matchups. Here's how I have the West going down. I have Colorado over Nashville in six. I have Minnesota over St. Louis in seven. I have Calgary over Dallas in five. And I have Edmonton over LA in seven. So I have all four higher seeded teams in the West taking it. Yes, same. You have the exact same? Yep, but I have different games. I got Colorado in five. I've got Edmonton in six, Minnesota in seven, and Calgary in five. That is literally the exact same thing I have. You and Brad? Yep. Gross. So that'll be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. That's pick the absolute opposite of everything we just did and enjoy your money. I have uh, Colorado over Minnesota, Calgary over Edmonton for the um, quarterfinals and the conference finals. I have Calgary over Colorado to make it to the cup finals. Hey, there's where we differ. I have Colorado over Calgary. I have Calgary over Colorado. Wow. There's, Neither of them are making the conference final. There's Hope everybody's aware of too much now. of a conversion. It'll be St. Louis. Yeah, it's going to be like a St. Louis, Minnesota conference finals or something. Well, yeah, that can't happen. It's in the first round. St. Louis. <laughs> St. Louis. <laughs> LA. LA. Yeah, why not? There you go. Uh, in the East, I have Florida over Washington in six. Wow. Five. I have Five. Tampa. Yeah, I think I might have been generous, but I. I I think it goes six. I have Tampa over Toronto in six. 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 You both have Tampa over Toronto? Yeah, of course. That's a loser franchise. Until they win something, I'm going to forever treat them like a loser franchise. Boston over Carolina in six. I think I had seven. I have seven. And you both have Boston? Yeah. Yeah. And I have New York over Pittsburgh in seven. Same. Six. You have New York? <laughs> Hold on. This. Hold on. Did we make one single separate pick in the first round? We did not. No. <laughs> Okay, for the listeners, we did I not have look my at each bra- other's brackets. <laughs> no, I, have, I, would, I barely looked at my own. <laughs> like, <laughs> I had to somehow find it again. <laughs> okay, so to reiterate, in the first round, you have Colorado, Minnesota, Calgary, Edmonton, Florida, Tampa, Boston, New York. Yes. yes. All three of us have the same eight. We all took the 
Like, uh, did not overthink this. Who who there is not the favorite? Well, I think I think Pittsburgh's underlying numbers are better than New York. I'm counting on New York goalieing Pittsburgh. I'm counting on Pittsburgh goalieing Pittsburgh. Yeah, that's also a fair point. So coming out of the East, I have Florida over Tampa Bay in probably what's going to be the best season series of the the year. I don't know. We we both we all predicted Calgary Edmonton second round. That's true. <laughs> uh, I have New York coming out over Boston, and then I, I don't have that. You have Boston over Boston in the conference finals? Yeah, I like all four teams in the Atlantic better than any team in the Metro. I think Shesterkin's going to go on a tear. He okay. has to. It's their only hope. And I think Florida prevails over New York to make make the cup finals. I have Florida going to the finals as well, just over Boston in the conference final. So you have a Colorado-Florida? Yeah, I really went out on a limb for that one. I have a Calgary-Florida cup finals in Edmonton. Or Edmonton. Evan, you have a... Calgary-Florida finals. <laughs> Jesus. Boy, Florida. We're, well, to be fair, we should want Florida to come out of the East. They are the most fun team in that conference. And if we want hockey to be fun, we want teams to build their team like Florida. So I'm hoping their formula for success works. It's Florida Junior versus Florida. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Cup champs. I have Calgary. That is a stupid pick because picking a Canadian team to win the cup when they haven't done it in so many years is like you're just throwing away your pick there. Daryl Sutter, though. I think they're playing the right kind of hockey. It's largely going to hinge on, I think, how... Did I sell you on Calgary? Yeah, I think you, you probably had a big big uh, voice in that. I think it, it depends on how Johnny Goudreau shows up, though. If, well, if he doesn't, they've got three or four other guys who are 40 goal scorers. That's true, but they don't have an easy path. Well, they might have an easy path. To they have a, an easier path than any other division. Yeah, because Colorado would have to face Minnesota. If St. Louis prevails over Minnesota, then that's a good St. Louis, right? Yeah. Who do you have winning the cup? Florida. I told you, I'm not. I every year I overthink this shit, and it goes horribly wrong. I'm, I'm just going with the pure logic of it all. These are the best teams, and I'm picking the best teams. Now the standings don't always do that. Like I said, at Boston over Carolina, et cetera, et cetera. But yeah, no, Florida. It's. I also have Florida winning. You have Florida over Calgary? What did I say their third line was last week? Like Noel Achari, Sam Reinhardt, and... Anton Lundell. Anton Lundell as the centerman. Like, that top nine is the best in the league. That's yeah. better than any first line the Red Wings rolled out in the last three weeks. <laughs> hey, I will not hear this Joey Poison slander. Calgary, Florida is, I think, a lot of... Like, this is a, the don't overthink it. No, the, Calgary is the overthinking it because everybody's like, well, we can't pick Colorado and Florida. That's too obvious. No, I, 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 have, <laughs> I have Calgary and Colorado on the same tier. I, I don't think you're crazy either way. So the two lower seeded teams that I took to come out that we all took to come out of the first round are Tampa and Boston. Are there any other lower seeded teams that might have a chance to to make the upset upset here? LA. This is hockey. So the answer is all of them. This hockey is truly the most random sport. What? preaching at me oh man this is like a annual general managers meeting yeah this is like <laughs> a, this is the sign they tap when they go into the door well what, the door. what's that one stat for the nhl to have the same uh equality of outcome in terms of a playoff series as the nba the nhl would have to have a best of 51 something like that yeah that's how random hockey is. There's okay. that much variance. So one goalie that makes no damn sense is going to get hot and blow up our bracket and run, run. And it won't be Shesterkin, and it won't be Vasilevsky. It won't be one of the ones we fully expect. Mike Smith was 9-0-0 in April. Like, hockey doesn't make sense. So pick anyone. Who the hell is Vili Husso? I don't know, but he's about to put up a 1.4 goals against average in these playoffs because <laughs> that's how this works. <laughs> This is the voice of a man who has been hurt before. <laughs> yes. You know what? If I didn't know you better, like you'd fit in real well as a Leafs fan. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? Like, also think about the Leafs right now. That season that they just had and those Leafs fans and like they're going hard about like the passion and everything and it's funny and. <sighs> Ryan, if you're trying not to send me and you're about to talk about the playoff format, you're just gonna send. No, me no, more. no, no, no. Okay, I, I will not hear complaints about the format right now. Like it is what it is. 
but those Leafs they have this year, and then they're looking at down the barrel at Tampa Bay. <laughs> so it is a playoff format. No, no, I'm just saying, like, it's so funny that this is their best season and their competition is this strong. Yeah. No, I know. I know. That's because the playoff format is stupid. But anyways. I think they would end up playing Tampa regardless. Or maybe it was Boston if it was one. <laughs> Like the, 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 so, yeah, to be fair, all eight teams in the Eastern Conference broke 100 points, which is just insane. It's, it's also a real shame that one of St. Louis and, the, and Minnesota have to go out in the first round. Like One of those fan bases are saying, we had a great year in this format, just screwed us. Meanwhile, one of Edmonton or L.A. is guaranteed the second round. If there's any one of my picks that I might change... I think it might be LA. Oh yeah. And I don't even think they're good. I just it, think I just think <laughs> something about Edmonton, they when they go hot, they are hot, but when they are cold, they are pissy. They're Toronto West. <laughs> yeah. And you know what? They have less to speak for in, in terms of goaltending and defense. Understanding that Mike Smith just True was- Doughty's out too. Not ideal. Yeah, but the this is also Edmonton, the team that lost to a 12th seed in the play-in tournament, but two years ago. I think for my picks, that might be wrong. You know, Toronto-Tampa Bay is like... Toronto goes out in the first round. Do we have a nuclear winter? Like, the answer is <laughs> it. they shouldn't because they're going up against the back-to-back Stanley Cup champions who just finished with, like, almost, what, 110 points? Common sense would say... No, yeah, that you're a still really good team that got beat by a really good team, but this is a loser franchise that does loser things. There's until a they win, until they win something, they have to change something. I think, I think if they do win, that shouldn't come as a s- surprise outside of that mental hurdle context. Yeah, they're they were the better team this year. They should win, but it's but yeah, but yeah, but it's the Toronto. If you took the Leafs' record as it is right now. But instead of Toronto, this was Boston against Tampa. Is Boston's getting picked in what seventy percent of brackets then? Yeah. But it's Toronto, and we know what they do, and we know how they are. They're a legitimately phenomenal team that collapses when it matters the most, and even not even collapses. They were the better team against Montreal in six of the seven games last year. The universe doesn't allow it. <laughs> I mean, pure if you take out any team name, they haven't won a series in what twenty. Plus twenty five years, like the data says, do not pick team that has not won a series in twenty five years. There are franchises that just win when given the opportunity, and franchises that just lose when given the opportunity. Like you throw over the last twenty years, Boston, Chicago, L.A. into any meaningful anything, they win. They just find ways to win, even if they shouldn't. Tampa, not Tampa, sorry, Toronto, Florida. There's a couple other teams. Like you throw them in in any important circuit, Arizona, they find a way to <laughs> blow it. Arizona won one of the play-in rounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so they've won a, air quotations, playoff series in the last two or three years. And I'm not even convinced that Tampa really had to even work that hard to get to the where they finished this season. I think it was very much a let's maintain and keep pace with the horses as best we can. And the real challenge is going to be the playoffs. Hey, Toronto did win a series in 2004. That was yes. 18, 18 years ago. Yeah. That's how you do the math. Their, their playoff drought could buy lottery tickets in Ontario right now. The, <laughs> the I think the two other series where we shouldn't be surprised is we all took Boston over Carolina. If anti Ranta, if either Frederick Anderson gets healthier, anti Ranta shows up and plays really well, that's a very good Carolina team. And Pittsburgh, like you said, Brad, losing Tristan Jari hurts. Casey DeSmith finds his form. Yeah, they That's still, a big ask. They still have a Sidney Crosby. They have a Sidney Crosby. They have an Evgeny Malkin. They, ha- like, they have a Tang. You can't really bet against those guys confidently. The one guy I forgot that was on that team is Ricard Raquel, too. Yeah, and he's... As Why? Far he had as like I know. four points against Detroit. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I remember he was on that team. <laughs> Everyone has like, four oh, points man, against Detroit. Man, that guy's really good. Who is that? <laughs> like, What are Casey DeSmith's stats this year? He posted a 914 save percentage. Yeah. That's not bad. But to be fair, I, well... I could be wrong, but I feel like the Rangers absolutely ran the Penguins show when they played this year. But, hey, the Rangers, you know, we we talk about they're all Shesterkin. And their defense is bad, but they still have Sabanachad, Panarin, Fox. Like, they're a, they, have, they have horses. They can 
go if they need to. They had a 50 goal score on Chris. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And the 50 goal score. <laughs> yeah, you're right. The Rangers did win the majority of those games. Okay. Why don't we uh, take a few minutes here to go through our segment sponsored by the FanDuel Sportsbook, where we take a look at some betting odds uh, and analyze what are some good opportunities. I know some people uh, shouted you out, Evan, because they we we called out. The, I missed. Uh, I did not read that then. You didn't read what? People called me out for something? No, no, no. You wouldn't know until I'm about to tell you right. Oh, OK. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Uh, some people shouted you out, Evan, because... Um, uh, we a little while back, I think Florida had longer odds for, to win the president's trophy. And we were like, hey, that's a really good. Someone actually did tell me that. Yeah. I don't know where uh, my brain doesn't work. So, yeah. Whatever. So glad that one worked out. And uh, we're going to look at some playoff series here. So the Rangers are favored over the Penguins. It's a minus 115 uh, versus a you know, minus 105 for, for the Pens. So the Rangers are the slightly better favorite there. To me, those odds are, are I think you just take who you believe is going to win the series. If, if you're going to put money down on that one, I don't think that there's like a value bet in there. It's it's a pretty, it's a tighter series. I mean, you know who is an underdog in this uh, playoff? So uh, the back-to-back defending cup champs going against the ultimate loser franchise. Yeah, that is, Brad is heavy against the Leafs right now. Yeah, he's like And hot. that's my job. Yeah. I want to fight another <laughs> podcast. This is... My uh, year's worth of bad Mo Cider takes uh, coming for revenge. Oh, this is your Michael Bunting. You had to listen to Michael Bunting for Calder for a year, so you're coming back at them right I'm now? Coming. But no, it's true. Like, the Leafs are that franchise. Like, I go through the roster, and there's not a lot to critique. I look at their roster on paper with Tampa, and at worst go, it's even. But they're the cursed team. They're the team that can't beat Columbus in a playoff. They can't beat... Montreal, who scraped into the playoffs in the worst division in hockey history. Like, what are the odds for that series, Ryan? Toronto's at minus 122 and Tampa's at plus 100. Still an underdog. I like Tampa at plus 100 there. Oh, I love that bet. Me too. <laughs> yeah, that's not bad. Flor- Florida, Washington, Florida minus 355, Washington 270. Ooh, stay hey. away from that one. Hey. But hey, no, you know who's been a loser franchise since 1996? Florida. And this is a different Florida and, Panthers. No, it is. But who's also won a cup in the last four years? Washington. Nobody should be shocked if Washington wins that series. I would, be, I would, I would be, be 100% shocked. My jaw would be on the floor. I would be surprised, not shocked. I mean, I picked Florida to win the cup. So obviously, I'm not saying Florida's <laughs> bad or I expect them to get upset. But this is a team that hasn't won a playoff series since you were three, Ryan. <clears throat> Yeah, but Florida hasn't been good for like the past seven years like the Leafs have. Actually, hold on. I may have screwed up my math. You're a November baby since you were two. <laughs> That's a lot of active math. I can't What's going on? My birthday. <laughs> no, what, you can't believe he did? Ah, uh, Google. <laughs> yeah. Um, ser- the uh, other series, I think, that has a similar line to Toronto, Tampa, without the same context, is Carolina is a minus 124 favorite over Boston is plus 102. If you're a believer in Carolina, take that number. But if you're like us and you're taking Boston, I don't hate that plus 102 either. I, I think that series is going to be tighter than people give it credit for. I don't think Carolina, like it's a shoe in or anything where all three of us should have picked Boston. I think we are probably going to end up being wrong there in all likelihood. But The other problem with brackets is you have to try and differentiate your bracket from the common thing. Yeah. Oh, you mean like us who basically took the favorites yeah. on everything and had three identical the brackets? Nuance, yeah, no, yeah, the no, I know. The right? of a bracket is not in your winners. It's of your road to the winners. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh, too late now. We didn't, we honestly, we did not talk about that. Can you tell me the uh, Edmonton LA odds? Yeah, Edmonton minus 230, LA plus 184. Speaking of betting against loser franchises. That's not bad either. I, I personally don't think LA is going to pull it off, but I I think Philip Deneau could potentially shut down one of or both Leon Dreisaitl and Connor McDavid. He put Rocket in this case, or he did a lot of... <laughs> what? Deneau. Deneau. He's saying you can't keep up with him. There's no way he skates with McDavid. Well, Connor, uh, Nathan McKinnon said Philip Deneau is the hardest player to play against in the NHL. I could see a path to L.A. winning that series, so I'm not necessarily disagreeing with you. I think that will be more of Edmonton's goaltending and defense um, defecating on themselves. Oh, I, I'm, not, I, I'm not saying L.A. is a good team. I'm saying there are players 
on that team who are capable of, you know, weathering that storm a little bit and allowing their other players to play against Edmonton's non-existent depth. I think you, you combine any kind of shutting down of Edmonton's top star with a bad Edmonton goaltending show, and you have the recipe for a potential upset there. I don't see it happening personally. I'm still taking Edmonton, but... Like, my prediction, if I had to funnel it down to one thing, is if Edmonton holds Connor McDavid to exactly a point per game, they probably LA. win that series. So, yeah, if L.A. holds McDavid to a point per game, they, they win that series. My thinking is, if L.A. splits the first two games, L.A. wins the series. I don't think Edmonton's got the mental fortitude to right the ship on the fly. You guys, anyone want to take Nashville at plus 430 versus Colorado's minus 620? Yeah, no, absolutely not. I'm not touching that with a 1,000 foot pole. Plus 235 for Dallas against Calgary's minus 300? No. Minnesota St. Louis is plus 120 for St. Louis versus minus 148 for Minnesota. That that series is a pick to me, so sure. Minnesota's honestly low-key a dark horse to make the cup finals here, in my mind. They're a really, really good team. And the, the knock against Minnesota every time... I read any take against them is yeah they're that team that's they're really deep they've got their goaltending figured out but like they don't have that like superstar like a Connor McDavid I'm like am I not the only one who's realizing that Kaprizov is going to be on some heart balance this year yeah they have that superstar now the last line I want to talk about here Stanley Cup the favorites are Colorado plus three twenty Florida's behind them at plus five fifty Calgary's a plus seven hundred. And then you have Carolina and Toronto at plus 1,000. You have Tampa Bay at plus 1,100. In my mind, Calgary and Tampa Bay are two great value bets there. Like, I let, I pick Calgary to win, so I would take them at plus 700. But if you think Tampa can three-peat, which is insanely hard to do in the modern NHL. I didn't even hear you list out Boston or Minnesota. Boston is at plus 1,800. Minnesota's at plus 1,600. Edmonton's plus 1,600. Rangers at plus 1,700. Yeah, those teams I don't care about. But I, I could see Boston, Minnesota going on runs. I could see them being the unconventional cup yeah. finalists. Didn't Minnesota – who did Colorado lose to last year? Last year? Wasn't it Vegas? I Yeah, it was Vegas. <laughs> One year ago, ten years ago, it's all about the yeah, same. Yeah, Colorado's not winning anything. The team they lost to couldn't even make the playoffs. It must be terrible. Yeah, jeez. That's another thing to talk about another time. Anyhow, uh, that is our um, – that was our quick look at the betting odds. Thank you to FanDuel for sponsoring that segment. And let us know what you guys did for your uh, brackets and uh, any bets that you put down. They put money on every series against us and just won a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> All into one parlay. Yeah, yeah. no kidding. All right. Uh, we are going to jump into overtime here. It's a longer episode, but we're still going to take some time for questions, which are brought to you by our Patreon supporters. These are the people who are responsible for us being able to do things like record a Blast Shell Out uh, episode with uh, uh, emergency, almost like last minute interview put in, as well as covering all this content and doing what we do. So thank you to our Patreon supporters for allowing the show to to roll on and patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast if you want to help support the show. So there's uh, a lot of comments here. We're going to get to a few of them and the rest are going to be in the Patreon exclusive overtime. Do you, do you want me to save my golf story for the Patreon over? Oh yeah, that's that's okay. a Patreon exclusive. Okay. All right. Uh, why don't we start with um, Cody Stark here who says, if the candidate hates dump and chase hockey, hire him on the spot. All jokes aside, I'd like to know or I know there's going to be a lot of bad talk about Blast today, but maybe we can talk about a few of the things we liked slash did well. Challenges. He did get really good at challenges. He was he was the Michael Rasmussen of challenges because he was really bad at them, and then he got really good at them. It is befitting that in his final game, he called the refs over and had them overturn what was initially called a no goal, and then they went and looked, and Pusudor did indeed score. So, hell yeah. And, and the video coaches have a lot to do with that as well. Uh, I always thought he was good at giving detailed ans answers and pressers, even if it seemed repetitive at times. He's a very personable guy and obviously has a really good hockey brain. And then Cody says, I love the $5 hot and ready drop pass on the power play when it was first implemented, but it got stale the last few seasons. Anything that you guys liked? You invested heavily into the meme economy. Yeah. The faces he made? Yes. Uh, the way he rolled out Maurice Sider and Lucas Raymond was the best thing that they could have asked for to start their careers. And not every head coach in the league would have done that. And we wouldn't have seen what we saw this year. My, he gave one of my favorite answers to a generic uh, question in a post-game press conference of 
all time. I won't even say the question. You'll know exactly what I'm talking about. S- score. <laughs> <laughs> he was a funny guy. Um, that guy that no longer has a job says, are we taking bets on how many steps Zadina and Hronik take next season? My money is on several and in the right direction this time. That's an interesting take. <laughs> I don't know that I agree. I don't know that I agree either. Um, I'm more confident that we'll see steps from both of them than not. I don't think they'll be significant, but they will be positive. I think there will be every opportunity for Philip Zadina to do more, but I will go so far as to defend anyone who, or defend Jeff Blaschel if anyone says it is Jeff Blaschel's fault that Zadina didn't perform to his potential. I think Philip Hronik is what he is. I think we know what he is as a player now. If a good coach will reduce the mistakes with Hronik, which is his problem, um, because Hronik has flashes of being dynamic and being, and making very positive impacts of the game. And then the next shift will go out and ruin it all. Um, Zadina, I will argue in Blaschel's favor. I don't think he was used as much as he should have been, but he, played well it's not Blashill's fault he couldn't hit the damn net you know what i mean like zadina was playing well Blashill underused him and didn't necessarily pair him with the best line mates all the time but while zadina was on the ice he was a noticeable player and then he'd create the chance and mess it all up himself so Unless Blashill was literally, literally had a string from the bench to Zadina's stick messing up his aim. Yeah, you're right. There can be more to be done for a player's confidence. And I think that's where Blashill could have stepped in. And maybe that could have headed off like the gripping the stick too tight and wiring it 20 feet over the bar at times. But at the end of the day, Zadina is the one who shot that puck. Yeah. There, were, there were a lot of overthinking it or just not taking the extra second because he was too panicked. So... I mean, we did see, I think, a better run of form, especially towards the end from Zadina. Once he got with Verona, um, he looked fantastic. But yeah, getting to Hironic, I I would actually be very, very shocked. Please, and I, I'm not saying it's impossible, I just don't consider it very likely that we're going to see like a 180 from Hironic. Question here from, and I'm Derek, says, where do you think Blaschel's next coaching gig will be? What level? And do you think Tange was kept for a reason? Let me talk about Tange first. So his contract wasn't up, and he was brought in very recently. There are, uh, there's a general line of thinking with assistant coaches that one of them, at least one is brought in by a head coach and usually the GM has a say in the other. It's not consistent. It's, pie. it's not consistent across the entire NHL, but a lot of teams, and I think the Red Wings in the past have operated that way. Tange just got here and he was always going to be given more of an opportunity uh, in the event that Blasha left, which is what happened. His contract's not up and you can count that as Eisenman's guy, quote unquote, whoever Eisenman hires as head coach will pick the other person on that bench. And also, if you look at everything that went wrong with the uh, team this year, obviously Blashill is in charge of all of it. But if you narrowed it down to how did the forwards, defense and goaltending performed, uh, the forwards performed the best out of that group comfortably. So if that was Tangay's group, yeah, if you were going to keep one guy around to bridge the gap, that would be the one. Um, and in terms of Blashill's next coaching gig, honestly, and just above him, Joseph Fournier calls this out, next head coach of MSU men's hockey does not sound crazy, especially knowing Blashill's roots in Michigan, and they need someone to build that program up. It'd be one hell of a pick to do it. Yeah, if he doesn't want to move his family. I think he would get an assistant coaching job in the NHL this summer if he wanted it. What do you think he would take an assistant coaching job? I have no idea. I think it's... I, I I almost think as someone in his position would be better suited having a head coaching gig, even at a at a lower level in the NCAA. It's different, right? And then you can jump back into a head coaching job at the NHL later. Or it could absolutely tank your career if MSU doesn't do well and you never step foot in the NHL again. It's the dangers uh, of coaching. Anything I know about the NHL, he'll he'll be through the the recycler at some point. Yeah. Uh, Jonathan Melwish says, hey, guys, do the Red Wings go for a bridge coach for a season or two and have an up and coming coach as an assistant or just go for someone Steve, Stevie sees as a long term coach? Uh, well, as you heard in the interview, I asked the question with uh, to Max and Prashanth, but I think it'll be a 
permanent coach because it's either going to be, hey, we want to be better right now, do it, or we're going to take our final step back this year and you are building this team from scratch in your mold. So that I don't think either option presents well for a temporary coach. And last question here is from Sinod says, so no call up for Bergeron. The Griffins were out of the playoff pictures in the last couple of games. Do you think it was a good call to not give him a game or two look, even if it's for him to get an idea of the pace and skill needed to make the jump next year? Yeah. Look at the Red Wings, how they finished the season. Nobody was going to come up and play for that team and have a good time. There's no point in my mind. I, I think you save it. You let him come in for a fresh team that's energized, that has the talent to surround him to shelter a little bit the Bergeron's not going to come up and do what Raymond Insider did in all likelihood you need to be you need to protect those guys and there's no reason to have them get caved in their first NHL games and uh we talked about this a few episodes ago about how much confidence can carry into um off periods like breaks summer break whatever um Bergeron's going into the summer on an absolute heater. This guy's going to feel like a million bucks going into training camp next year right now. So it was the right call to not bring him up and potentially risk having him having two or three catastrophically bad games, which is more likely than the alternative. Um, so yeah, he, he gets to ride that high all summer now. All right. We're going to wrap up this episode. Thank you all for tuning in. There's a lot coming your way. We are doing a full Detroit Red Wings season uh recap it's going to be probably a couple parts yeah maybe it would have started today if not for the blashell news it so. would have started today <laughs> so uh stay tuned for that there's plenty of draft content coming up uh draft lottery is may 10th we'll be doing a live stream for that so uh a lot coming your way we'd like to thank everyone for tuning in everyone for listening thanks for bearing through a longer episode today and i uh, would like to also shout out to the sponsors of this podcast the FanDuel Sportsbook all of our patrons and our name level Patreon supporters, Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, the Stay Fresh Cheese Bag, Nick Perks, Brett Bailey, Terry Driver of the number 69, Crying Ryan Han has been in a slam of Jamathong, Matthew M. Rice, Billy Howell, Brandon M., Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Citizen High Five, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Craig Kibble, Daniel Garcia, Derek Enstam, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hana Lee, Hassam al Qasem, I'd Leave My Wife for Cider, Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Justin and the Angry Mob, Kaylin Wood, King Tone, Kyle Hashman, Matt McKay, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Ryan Hubbard, Scott Martin, Sean Levine, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Sean, welcome to the Dub Dub Club and thank you for, for your support. Stay fresh cheese bags, stay fresh greech bags. The master and champion of the Winged Wheel podcast, the, fresh, the freshest of cheese bags, the legend himself, Joseph F. and Fournier. Vibe Burr Raider. Shithead. Zach Spring, Sam Bankson, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Adam, Now I Finish Better Than Ernie, Antonio Gracias, Babe Landiscog, Ben Barron, Cheese Bags, Stay Fresh, Connor Leighton, Dave W., Evans Parking Garage, Evans Bingo Cart, uh, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, Jeremy Brocker, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, sorry I forgot to change my name back. Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Matt Keeler, Matt at Matt S, Missing Vladdy More Than Ever, Papa Woody, Puck Norris, Revy DeLuca, Salty and Delicious, Stay Fresh Cheese Bags, Trevor Pebovar, Zach Handyside, and Zach McCann of Driving Range Superstar. Thank you all so much. We'll talk soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.